Hi, I'm John from the Christian Century, and I'm excited to chat again today with one of our Voices columnists, Julian Deschazier. Julian has written for us what I can only call a controversial piece about credentialism among pastors and the PhD degree. So we're going to be chatting about that. Uh, but first, uh, Julian, for those of us who don't know you or your work, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Hello, everybody. Julian Deschazier, Pastor University Church, which is in the High Park neighborhood of Chicago. I'm a senior minister there. I serve as the director of experiential education at McCormick Theological Seminary as well, and on the faculty there, and I do not have a PhD. <laughs> Amazing. And I'm and you, also Quest. Per, you also perform music. Tell us a little bit about your music. That's right. And I'm Jay Quest as well, perform music and and get on stage in a different kind of way, um, doing hip hop as well. So very cool. Okay, well, um, you don't have a PhD, neither do I. So now let's let's blast uh PhDs. Uh just kidding. Um, in this article, um, you talk about this trend, this this phenomenon where there is a, a real push for clergy. Uh, in some traditions, to, to get PhDs. I'm new to mainline Protestantism. So this is a new idea for me. In my old tradition, I think education generally was undervalued. So for those of us who might be in the same boat as me, who aren't as familiar with this, could you tell us a little bit about this, this whole fad? Like, what, what, what is this push for PhDs? How does it show up? Why, why is this emphasis there? Well, I think it comes out of a uh, sense that uh, the educated ones are the ones who are the most well equipped to lead us. And that's not, you know, like, that's not like a fad, like bell bottoms or anything. That's like, you know, that, that comes out of a sense in, in particular communities and maybe every committee community, you know, where like, okay, if a person has the highest level degree possible that they are, uh, you know, you want your doctor to have the the best credentials possible you know and and if you have to choose between the doctor who has fewer and the one with more all things being equal you choose the one with more you know I, I, what we see though is that that comes over into faith communities in some strange ways and so folks uh start saying well i gotta have the biggest degree that i can possibly get even if we know and that's what the article is about it's not bashing the phd at all but it's saying we know we know and people with phds know that you don't need a phd to do excellent ministry you know uh folks have given um uh examples of of niebuhr and other folks who have been like these um, icons of, of the work that we do and didn't have PhDs, I think are just a couple of the examples. But I mean, the context you grew up in is very similar to mine. It's like, you know, my the, the youth pastors and the folks who I felt the most connected with, none of them had PhDs um, and they didn't need them to connect with me and, and to do the work of love. And so there's this question of what what is the right degree or track for education in order for us to be uh, ready for ministry? And then what is the degree we need to open the most doors possible? Those And those are kind of two different questions that have become one kind of jump, kind of messy question right now. And that's all I wanted to take a moment to do is just to unpack those two and say, okay, let's deal with those separately. Yes, thank you. I shouldn't have joked about blasting PhDs. That we're not going to title this video "Julian Deschazier blasts PhDs." Uh, <laughs> please don't, please. <laughs> well, well, people's response to me though has been like a couple of people uh, have been in their feelings about this, whether they're on the PhD track or they just got their degree and they're like, you know, well, I like my degree. You know, I'm okay with this degree. Like, I I don't see any problem with it. And I'm like, well, I, show me where I said there's a problem with it like that. I have no problem with it. Many times I've thought about getting it myself, but ultimately though, I realized like for the work that needs to be done to do that, um, could I continue to do my ministry in a way like, would I need that to do my ministry, you mm -hmm. know, or were there other things that I could look at like the D man or other kinds of, of degree options that I, I'm sure we can talk about, you know? So yeah. it's, it's, it's not about blasting the PhD, but it's about recognizing, you know, like that, that story about my friend is a true story. Like he wanted to get a PhD, not because he had some question of that. He wanted to offer critical depth on and be a, a leader in the field, mm -hmm. but like, Oh no, I like there are certain churches who won't talk to me unless 
I have because they want a pastor who has a PhD, you know, and, and it's like yeah. that, that, uh, that's, that's nauseating. I just got to be honest like that, that, that ain't it right there. Yeah. And and well, that in your article, that tendency, um, you bring into conversation with this hockey advice that's become kind of cliche business advice as well, right. which is that we need to skate where the puck is going, not where it is or where it used to be. How does that advice in your mind relate to this whole insistence on PhDs in the church? Well, I just think the notion that credentials altogether are are a stamp on your capacity to do uh, ministry in an ethical, moral, healthy, uh, theological sound way uh, in the public is, is just not sound anymore. Maybe it wasn't then, but I wasn't around when that stuff kind of got started to be able to say what were the the, uh, the features that caused folks to start looking at uh, pastors who had PhDs as somehow better than pastors who had DMs, which is really like when you unpack it, it's really not logical. It's just, there's, there's just no logical base to it, but that's kind of the place we got to like, oh, you got the PhD, you're serious, you're for real, you're a real thinker, you're deeper, whatever, you know? Um, and so I, I just know that where we're looking at in terms of, of where I think the puck is headed to use that metaphor is a way of thinking about church leadership that isn't tied uh, so it, it isn't tied to these, I, I'll just say it, frankly, you know, kind of sometimes colonial ways of thinking about education, you know, putting folks through the right system. So now you're ready uh, for the big time, you know, as opposed to recognizing that some people are coming through with wonderful gifts for ministry and showing real capacity for ministry, but um, have MDiv equivalencies or other kinds of things and are like, you know, they've got the experience, but we don't have the ways to be able to assess that. Like all we look at are the letters. All we know how to look at right now are the degrees. So how can we look at skills and, and competencies as something that's gonna be more important to make sure that when folks are, are going into congregations or however they're doing faith leadership, that they're actually competent and not just like credentialed. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So you mentioned the demon degree a couple of times as the doctor of ministry. And um, I, I know several people who have this degree. I have considered it and I'm still considering it myself. Um, the folks I know who have it have said really good things about their experience. They've learned a ton that's really practical to the ministry they're doing and will do. So I'm just curious if you wanted to share any thoughts on demon degrees and um, maybe why you think they're looked down on by, by some folks. Yeah. I, so when I went to seminary, I, I was at University of Chicago Divinity School where they offered a Ph.D., but not a D-man. And then I began to go work at McCormick Seminary right across the street where they offered a D-man, but not a Ph.D. And um, got a chance to see both sides of that. And one of the things that I instantly began to recognize is that a lot of these folks who are doing D-men are like they are passionate and embedded in in ministry on the ground like they are doing ministry public ministry public and professional ministry that the d-man was not just doing the critical thinking and the and the research and all of that you know but really taking a problem and then thinking about potential interventions and then actually doing those and then being able to do assessment on those interventions, like problem solving, you know, like around a project uh, that is relevant in your context. Like it's, it's, we need the deep thinking that is offered by the PhD track. We need um, folks to dive deep into ethics, theology, Bible, ministry, all of that kind of stuff. And we need folks who inside of our parishes know how to take this content and do something with it and make sense out of it, that that content doesn't live in a book now uh, or a library, but that it will live in with the people. And I think the D-Men degree I've learned in my time at McCormick uh, around those students and seeing that program continue to flourish is that that that's really what it's there for you know a, a group of folks who let's let's face it we recognize that in the church um we don't need people in the american church who can read german for example it's not a diss 
that's not a diss, but that's a thing you got to do in the PhD, right? Like you're going to have to pick up German, probably two or three other languages, you know, depending on, on what you're trying to do. And that you just recognize I can be taking that time and really be working on this problem and working on these interventions and, and doing some assessment and thinking more deeply around the practical elements of this. And so, you know, it's, it's both and, but the notion that the D-Men degree is a stepchild to the PhD or it's a shortcut to being the Reverend Doctor. And that's a lot of, that is that is the way that a lot of congregations look at the D-Men. Like, oh, you, just, you didn't wanna do the four or five year thing. You just get the two or three year. Okay, you know, like we gotta slow down on that because one thing that it's doing is for congregations themselves, it's keeping them from, a, a gigantic pool of folks who either have DMs or just MDivs or maybe even MTS or, you know, other degrees that have the talent, like they can lead your congregation right now, but you won't even look at them because on the profile, it's like PhD preferred, but we won't say why. We won't say why. Okay, let's just say why. Why do we want our, this person to have a PhD because we really want our pastor to be a writer or in the academy or, you know, to be uh, doing robust work within a particular field, or we want, you know, no one's ever needed a PhD to go visit the hospital mm -hmm. or yeah. to bury or to baptize or to, con to convene the table or uh, lead liturgies on Sundays or whatever other day. And so it's just that why, that's, that's, been, that's the thing that being inside of the seminary community and then even asking myself, being around all these seminaries and people ask, oh, you're gonna get your doctor. I'm sure you're gonna get your doctor, right? And it's like, well, why? Yeah. And one reason is because I, I would want it, you know? And, and some people just do it because they want it, fine. I'm not here to tell you like, don't want it. <laughs> Uh, I'm talking more to those places that say you have to have it in order to be good enough to do this work. Show us. I don't see that. I don't see that. Yeah. And, and if I read your article correctly, I think you were suggesting one of the reasons congregations take that stand is that like they want to feel better about themselves and they get something out of uh, for self-esteem for having a pastor with a PhD. But I got the pastor who's got the the uh the Morehouse degree and the University of Chicago doctorate and all that you know that's that that looks better on us you know we got the best of the best and that's because we're the best of the best you know like there's there's this sense of of ranking that I see going on with especially I hear about it a lot because so many of my peers are looking for for places to lead and so they're going through these search and call processes. And this is the feedback that they're getting, you know, like yeah. nobody's telling them they're not equipped. They're not even getting to the table to talk and show how equipped they are because mm -hmm. they don't have a degree. Now that I hear that enough times, John, I got it right. Like, like <laughs> I, we got to talk about this. We got to, well, I'll, <laughs> I'll get in trouble. Get mad at me. I'm cool with that. Yeah, I'm cool with that. Well, I'm glad you wrote it for us and uh, a really great article. Um, it's You're not only giving us great insight here, but you're giving me so many great potential video titles because I'm thinking now, Julian Deschazier says, we don't need pastors who can read German. So that's another contender for, um, just kidding. I, I, I'll, 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 I'll just send you versions of the video with funny titles that- uh, that Yeah, that's you. right. Um, That's okay. Right. Last question. I would honestly be happy to talk about this, these ideas for, for a long time. But one more question. At the very end of the article, you briefly mention ordination processes and seminary curricula. And you say that what, what we need is for them to not just help students open doors, but to help them pursue their vocations. And I just wanted to ask if you had any um, specific ideas in mind when you, when you think about ordination processes and seminary curricula and how they might be revised. Um, anything you wanna share on that? I, I am still thinking through it as I think most seminaries are right now and curriculum redevelopment and all that. And all of it boils down to being able to say to folks who are passionate about ministry, hey, come here because, you know, we wanna help you learn how to. We wanna help you refine particular skills in or find and develop particular skills that are already within you um, around certain things. Like we, what, what no seminary should be in the business of is saying, hey, I know you need a degree to get ordained, come get it from us. 
you know, uh, we shouldn't be in that business. We should be in the work of, of going alongside people who are hearing from God, are having these kinds of, of uh, Pentecostal moments and, and, and deep revelation. And we should be institutions, both as seminaries and ordaining bodies, who go alongside these people and say, I'm not going to tell you whether what God is saying or not saying. I'm going to tell you this, though. For, for what we understand about the state of the church today, you're going to need to know how to do this. You're going to need to know how to do this. You're going to need to know how to do this. You know, and that that curriculum is going to shift across several years. You know, like it's not going to be a static, like, oh, th- th- what you learned 40 years ago, you know, every seminary is the same as long as you come out of here. Like, no, it's, it's about having a kind of flexibility to be able to read like what 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 the times are right now, what's going on right now, and to be able to shift and adjust as needed. And so some people have asked me that since the article released, like, so where's the puck headed? You know, like, what are we doing? And I think like the, the general answer that I have is like the puck is headed towards us thinking about competencies needed and not just degrees needed. The, the puck is headed towards us looking at really what it, what goes into the fullness of leading a congregation, both at the theological side and the uh, performative, you know, liturgical side, but also at the administrative side and the executive side and the community-based uh, engagement side, you know, like all of those kinds of things, I think, are give a more fuller picture of where the church is needed and therefore the kinds of leaders who are going to be needed in the church. Wow. Yeah. And, and, you know, I loved my seminary experience. I went to a great seminary, but not all of those aspects are taught very robustly. Yeah. A lot of so, and, and a lot of times it's like, you got, I mean, I'm there, right? You got theology, you got Bible, you got ethics. And then like ministry is like everything else. It's like yeah. everything else. You get one preaching class, you get, uh, you know, like you get so little in terms of what you'll be doing the most of. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, that just feels like, a, again, somebody from a generation ahead of me, older, somebody older than us would have to say like, here's why we did that. Here's why we set it up like that, because now we look at it now. And and this is, I think, a reason why so many people are like, "Uh, do I need seminary? You know, like uh." and enrollment's down everywhere across the board, across Mm -hmm. the board. So um, so being able to say, you know, ask a different set of questions, I think, is, is kind of the time we're in right now. Wow. Well, thank you so much for chatting, Julian. It's been a lot of fun uh, to hear from you. Um, For those out there, if you haven't gotten a chance to read this article, the link uh, will be below in the video description. You can read the well-credentialed pastor. In addition, we'll have a link down there where you can check out Julian's music. Uh, Julian, thanks so much for talking today. As always, thank you.